In this presentation, the block of scripture that we will be considering and looking for doctrines and principles is Alma chapter 8 through 12. So let's take a look at first an introduction to Alma 8 through 12. Alma's ministry to the city of Ammonihad illustrates how God supports his servants who faithfully obey him, even in times of great difficulty or personal sacrifice. After an initial attempt to preach in a wicked city, Alma was blessed with a visit from an angel who assured him of his standing before God and instructed him to return to Ammonihah. There a man named Amulek had received instructions from an angel who told him to receive Alma. Later, both men inspired to know how to contend with skilled lawyers who were intent upon creating discord for personal profit. Alma and Amulek's experiences serve as a model for us today. Although you still have challenges to face, Heavenly Father will bless you with reassurance, inspiration, and assistance as you seek to obey Him. In addition, these chapters illustrate the power of bearing down in pure testimony against those opposed to the work of the Lord. Notice the impact of the doctrines of the restoration and final judgment had upon Zeezrom. Consider how these doctrines can affect your heart and testimony as well as those around you. So with that introduction, let's now begin with Alma chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 1, the phrase, Alma returned to Zarahemla, where he rested a short time from his ministry, missionary labors. During nearly all the ninth year of the reign of the judges of the people of Nephi, about 83 B.C., Alma labored that the church of God, of which he was the presiding high priest, should be set in order both in Zarahemla and in Gideon. This, with the help of the Lord, he accomplished by himself, as he had done in Zarahemla. So also he did in Gideon. He appointed priests to teach the people, that they might hear and know the commandments of the Lord, and further to quicken them to a continual remembrance of the sacred vows they had made when received, when received into God's holy order. There were many things that Alma taught the people of Gideon which Mormon, the abridger of Alma's record, could not write. The record of Alma was undoubtedly large, consisting of a great number of plates, and besides Mormon, who was trained in the art of engraving his words upon middle plates, nevertheless found it difficult to express the fullness of his thoughts in the words at his command. The arduous task which Alma had performed in his missionary labors had greatly deprived him of his normal strength and vitality. The journey he had taken, the joys and sorrows he had experienced, the pleasure and pains caused by the faith or lack thereof among church members had drawn deeply upon the energy he had so unselfishly offered in the cause of Christ. Knowing that the body has limits beyond which it must not go, as well as resources that urge it to greater effort, Alma Philip was wise to rest for a while in his own home in Zarahemla, where he for a short time recruit, re, recruited his strength and well-being. Alma chapter 8, verses 3 through 6, the phrase, Alma departed from thence and took his journey over into the land of Mulek, and he came to a city which was called Ammonihah. No doubt there were many cities and villages in which Alma preached and of which we have little or no record. Mormon writer-editor was striving to preserve those lessons and precepts which would be of everlasting worth to future readers. In some cases thereof, he did not seem to feel the need to repeat a concept or a lesson or a teaching experience over and over again. Rather, he provided one strong illustration, such as Alma's discourse at Zarahemla, to make his point. In this case, because the people of Melik responded positively and receptively to his gospel message, Mormon reserved the space on the plates for something else. There was a negative lesson to be learned from the people in Ammonihah. Chapter 8, verse 9, the phrase, Satan had gotten great hold upon the hearts of the people. The Spirit, meaning the light of Christ, enlightened every man through the world that hearkeneth to the voice of the Spirit. 
And everyone that hearkeneth to the voice of the Spirit cometh unto God, even the Father. And the Father teacheth him of the covenant, the gospel covenant. And the whole world lieth in sin and groaneth under, dark, under darkness and under the bondage of sin. And by this you may know they are under the bondage of sin because they come not unto me, from DNC 84. That is, because they receive not the message of the gospel as preached by his anointed servants. Chapter 8, verse 10. Alma labored much in the spirit, wrestling with God in mighty prayer. Meant Alma knew that something unusual would need to take place if the hard inhabitants of Ammoniah were to be touched by his message. He therefore pleaded with anxiety and with the energy of his heart for an endowment, an outpouring of divine grace such as, a, as would soften hearts and magnify his poor words to such an extent that souls might be won. Alma's experience is a marvelous example of a pertinent but often painful reality that the righteous and personal power of the preacher is only one factor in the conversion of a people. The listeners must open their hearts, be willing to acknowledge and confess their weaknesses, and ponder and pray about what is spoken. Alma labored with all the faith he could muster, but faith is built upon evidence, and in this case, as in the case of Mormon in Mormon 3.12 or Jesus in Mark 6, 1 through 5, the intransigence of the Ammonites precluded the miracle of conversion at that time. Elder Joseph E. Worland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles suggested ways we can elevate and seek to improve the strength of our prayers. Quote, may I ask you today to consider the effectiveness of your prayers. How close do you feel to your Heavenly Father? Do you feel that your prayers are answered? Do you feel that the time you spent in prayer enriched and uplifts your soul? Is there room for improvement? There are many reasons our prayers lack power. Sometimes they become routine. Other prayers become hollow when we say similar words in similar ways over and over so often that the words become more of a recitation than a communication. This is what the Savior described as vain repetition. Such prayers, he said, will not be heard. Do your prayers at times sound and feel the same? Do you have ever said a prayer mechanically, the words pouring forth as throw cut from a machine? Do you sometimes bore yourself? as you pray. Perhaps that you do not demand much of your thoughts will hardly merit much attention from our Heavenly Father. When you find yourself getting into a routine with your prayers, step back and think. Meditate for a while on the things for which you really are grateful." End of quote. Great counsel on our prayers and great things that we need to could think about to strengthening them. Chapter 8, verses 11 through 12, the phrase, We know that thou art Alma. Many of the people of Ammonihah had known Alma and Zarahemla during the early days of the Republic. They had found Ammonihah to have a place far away from those who strictly kept the law of Moses and where they could revel unmolested in their queer belief that all men unmindful of their wicked ways would be saved. They rejoiced in what they called liberal doctrines. They forgetting that the doctrines of the Lord's salvation are the most liberal of all and the most forgiving of any. The Ammonites readily recognized that Alma was the presiding high priest over the church, which they said was founded upon tradition. And further they said, we do not believe in such foolish traditions. When Alma, in obedience to his divine command, commitment, commanded them to repent, they took singular joy in declaring their freedom from his authoritative injunction by their proclaiming severance from Alma's church, which was the church of God. Therefore, they said, Thou hast no power over us. They also took malignant satisfaction because Alma had given up the judgment seat to another. For that reason, they further gloated in their ignorance and infatuation, shouted, Thou art not the chief judge over us. And so it is with the apostates, as they glory in their apostate condition, thinking they are free when they are actually in bondage. 
Chapter 8, verse 14, the phrase being weighed down with sorrow. There are few pains as poignant to the righteous servants of God as that which comes through being pre prevented from sharing the truths of the gospel. Alma has known the instability of a double-minded life, has felt the pains of conscience which fall in the wake of sin not repented of, has lived through the achings and agonies of unrealized potential. He also knows the gladness of remitted sins, the unspeakable joy of restoration to righteousness, the peace of partaking of Christ's redeeming love. He knows the power and majesty of the Almighty to deliver one from bitter darkness into the marvelous light of Christ. He has been born again and desires the same for all his people. Chapter 8, verse 15, the phrase, Thou hast great cause to rejoice, for thou hast been faithful. An angel sent from the courts of glory, the same angel who had struck down the wayward and wandering Alma and the sons of Mosiah about two decades earlier, had re returned to offer consolation and comfort and counsel. His initial message was one of assurance, the quiet but powerful acknowledgement that Alma had been faithful, that his offering was acceptable before God. A piece of soul comes to the obedient and the faithful that is unknown to the flighty and the inconsistent, an inward awareness that God is pleased with their efforts. Such feelings may come in spite of results, in spite of success or lack of it, at least as measured by worldly standards. One who labors with fidelity and devotion, seeking diligently to lead others to baptism, is successful in the Lord's eyes. We can come to know if we are acceptable before God. We just need to ask Him. And then if we are not, ask Him for those things I need to change or start doing that would make my life acceptable before Him. After having noteworthy success preaching the gospel in other cities, Alma was reviled, spit upon, and cast out of Ammonihah. Then came reassurance from the angel that Alma's efforts were acceptable to the Lord and that Alma should return and preach again to the people. Commenting on those who sometimes feel their best efforts are not enough or that they have failed, President Thomas S. Monson stated, quote, do your duty, that is best, leave unto the Lord the rest. Should there be anyone who feels he is too weak to change the onward and downward course of his life, or should there be those who fail to resolve to do better because of their greatest of fears, the fear of failure, there is no more comforting assurance to be had than these words of the Lord, my grace is sufficient for all men, that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. Miracles are everywhere to be found when priesthood callings are magnified, when faith replaces doubt, when selfish service eliminates selfish striving, the power of God brings to pass his purposes. End of his quote. Chapter 8, verse 16, the phrase, Yea, say unto them, except they repent, the Lord God will destroy them. There are many reasons why we in the church send out missionaries. First and foremost is to make the blessings of the gospel, the covenants and saving ordinance in particular, available to all of our Heavenly Father's children. Second, the labor of selfless service associated with missionary work builds a saintly character and a stability of soul in the missionary that proves an invaluable asset to the kingdom of God. Sorry, that should be two. We got a typo there. There, I'll fix that to the kingdom of God. Third, we preach the gospel as a way of warning the nations of which is to come. Behold, I say and sent you out to testify and warn the people, and it become every man who has been warned to warn his neighbor. Therefore, they are left without excuse, and their sins are upon their own heads. From Doctrine and Covenants 88. Further, let your preachings be the warning voice, every man to his neighbor, in mildness and in meekness, it says in Doctrine and Covenants 38. Alma was to return, sorry, I don't know how I missed.
Alma was to return to Ammonihah to lift a warning voice to declare his with words of soberness that a speedy and certain destruction awaited the people there if they did not repent. God never destroys a people or a nation without first warning them. We'll fix that other type of those. So God will always warn a people, a nation, a country, or whatever with before destruction comes. Chapter 8, verse 17, the phrase, They do study at this time that they may destroy the liberty of my people, refers to. The angel further warned Alma that at the very moment the wickedly guided people of Ammonihah were giving great consideration as how they might destroy the liberty of thy people. The angel declared that such taking away of the rights of the Lord's people was against God's commandments, for his statutes and judgments prohibited force in any behavior. Free agency to be free to choose one's own actions has been decreed throughout eternity, and now the sin-stained people of Ammonihah work to bring to naught God's holy purposes. You can see why Mormon included this story in the gold plates. We have people today that are trying to destroy the liberty of our country and try to rule by force and compulsion and unrighteous dominion. We are facing some of the same things that these people have faced. And we must learn from them and wake up and stand up for freedom, for agency, and for our liberty. Chapter 8, verse 18 the phrase, he returns speedily. Although the idea of returning to the city of Ammonihah, to the abuse and scorn which he knew awaited him there, must have been an unpleasant one, Alma was obedient to the words and will of the Lord as delivered by the angel. He hurried to do what he had been called to do. That is integrity. President Henry B. Iron in the First Presidency taught that prompt obedience to the Lord is necessary to our spiritual well-being. Quote, How much faith, however much faith to obey God we now have, we will need to strengthen it continually and keep it refreshed constantly. We can do that by deciding how to be more quick to obey and more determined to endure. Learning to start early and to be steady are the keys to spiritual preparation. A loving Heavenly Father and His beloved Son have given us all the help they can to pass the rest, the test of life set before us. But we must decide to obey and then do it. We build the faith to pass the test of obedience over time and through our daily choices. We can decide now to do quickly whatever God asks of us. End of quote. Chapter 9, verses 19 through 27. This incident dramatizes how the Lord prepares the way for his servants. It highlights how divine providence orchestrates the scheme of things in such a way as to accomplish the greatest good. Before Alma had ever returned to town, an angel had appeared to Amalek with special instru specific instructions as to how he was to meet and care for Alma. It is just an amazing miracle how God, in midst of all of the iniquity and contention and those trying to destroy God's work, how during all of that, God can get his work done and do it speedily and effectively, even in the midst of such wickedness. Chapter 8, verse 20, the phrase, Thou wilt be a blessing unto me in my house, was, meant, It is indeed a privilege to house and care for the servants of the Lord. This is Almulek who said this to Alma. Their presence and personal powers prove an unspeakable blessing to the home in which they reside temporarily. Mormon's account include, in, indicates that Alma tarried many days with Almulek before he began to preach unto the people. One can but imagine what a remarkable experience it must have been to be tutored and prepared by Alma and by angels. Amalek's home during this brief season would have served as a most unusual missionary training center. Chapter 8, verse 26, the word fasting. Alma fasted to prepare his mind and soul to preach the inhabitants of Ammonihah. 
Fasting often indicates to the Lord the seriousness of our request. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency taught, quote, At times fasting is appropriate as a strong evidence of our sincerity. When we fast, we humble our souls, which brings us more in tune with God and His holy purposes. End of quote. Elder Joseph E. Wordland enumerated some of the blessings that flow into our lives when we add prayer to an appropriate fast. Quote, Fasting coupled with mighty prayer is powerful. It can fill our minds with the revelations of the Spirit. It can strengthen us against times of temptation. Fasting and prayer can help develop within us courage and confidence. They can strengthen our character and build self-restraint and discipline. Often when we fast, our righteous prayers and petitions have great power. Testimonies grow. We mature spiritually and emotionally and sanctify our souls. Each time we fast, we gain a little more control over our worldly appetites and passions. Fasting in the proper spirit in the Lord's way will energize us spiritually. It will strengthen our self-discipline, fill our homes with peace, lighten our hearts with joy fortify us against temptation and prepare us for times of adversity and open the windows of heaven. End of quote. Those are some great blessings indeed. Chapter 8, verse 30, the phrase, they were filled with the Holy Ghost, meant, that is, they enjoyed the gifts and powers of the Spirit in their ministry, discernment, prophecy, revelation, knowledge, wisdom, the ministering of angels, charity, and many others. Having been sanctified from sin, they had their hearts and mouths filled with holiness and with heavenly power. They spoke what was given them from above. Their words enjoyed the satisfaction the justifying and sustaining power of God. Let's now turn to Alma chapter 9. Alma 9, 1 through 7. The phrase Alma began again to teach the people of Ammonihah. Verse 1, obedience to the divine command he had received, Alma took with him his faithful benefactor and protector, Amulek, and once again began to declare the word of God to the apostate people of Ammonihah. To the righteous entreaties of the two missionaries, the wicked sisters of that great city were from the very first antagonistic. Verses 2 and 6, they sought to contend with God's servants upon matters of fundamental doctrines, questioning Alma's authority and asking him, Who art thou and who is God? Truly in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Alma's response to this criticism, also voiced in verse 6, by inviting Alma to, Amulek to share his testimony in what we have now as chapters 10 through 11. Verses 3 to 4, they twisted and turned the prophet's words in an effort to ensnare him, as it were, in a fowler's net. They implied in their bitterness that the great marvelous things of which Alma spoke, even the passing away of the earth and the destruction in one day of their magnificent city, were not to be believed in upon the testimony of just one man, and especially of him whom they said was a liar and an untrustworthy witness. Ironically, the contenders do not realize here that they are speaking the truth, speaking of time yet future when there shall be a new heaven and a new earth, first at the time of the second coming, initiation of the millennium, when the earth will be terrestrialized, and again at the end of the earth after the thousand years, when the earth will become the fit abode of those who inherit celestial quarry. Verse 5, their hard hardness kept them from seeing or feeling the truth taught by Alma. Remember what it said? The listener has a responsibility. Alma has all the spirit in the world. He has fasted, he has prayed, he is prepared. But that is to no avail to those who will not listen by the Spirit. Verse 7, as happens with many who openly rebel against God, soon the enmity of the Ammonites towards Alma became a venomous ill will. So great was their hatred of him that they sought to do him bodily harm. They attempted to deceive him forcibly that they, that they thereby 
that thereby they by brutal strength might end forever the terrible forebodings of coming woe which he pronounced upon their fair city. But they could not lay their, hand, their wicked hands upon him, for the protecting power of the great Jehovah was over him. And Alma stood forth boldly, and being unafraid, once more testified to them of their iniquitous ways. Chapter 9, verses 8 through 14. Here Alma pleads with his people to remember to recall that God is able to deliver his people from destruction. He cites examples from their nation's past to illustrate Jehovah's hand is ever ready to assist his people if they will reach out to him. The people of Ammonihah had forgotten the Lord's commandments and were working the works of darkness. In the, per in the perverse imagination of their hearts, they thought they saw the fulfillment of their wicked desires in the still more wicked abandonment of him who he led their fathers out of peril when none but God could deliver. They gave, li they gave little heed to the fact that the divine guidance has plotted their great ancestor, piloted their great ancestor Lehi across the ocean to the land of Zion. They also forgot how many times their repentant brethren had been saved from destruction at the hands of the Lamanites through God's long suffering and mercy. And so it is with the apostates. They are very quick to forget and very forgetful of the things God has done for them in the past. Not only did Alma put the Ammonites upon firm notice that salvation's priceless gift, eternal life in God's kingdom, came but to those who forsook evil and resolved forthrightly to sin no more, but he unreservedly declared unto them that the Lord commanded them now to repent. If they rejected his command and continued their evil ways, then death and destruction would be their portion. However, the Lord does not desire death of the sinner, but that the transgressor live and remain unto him. It was for this very reason that Alma had been sent to Ammonihah. His message was eternal life, not death. He came to bring salvation, not destruction. Only as a last resort would the prescribed penalties be meted out because of their iniquities. God's love for his children stayed his hand. But nonetheless, if continued rebellion against his laws prevailed in the past, then Alma said that God would not turn away from his fierce anger. God is so eager to bless us. But the law of justice also says if we persist in our wicked ways, then judgments of God must come and destruction. Alma waxed vehement in denouncing the evil practices of the people of Ammonihah, and in so doing pointed out to them that in the day of judgment, notwithstanding the wickedness of the Lamanites, the punishment meted out to them by the righteous judge who should be there and then preside would be less harsh upon the Lamanites than upon them. Yea, upon them they have had revealed to them the light of Christ, and yet they rejected its rays. It will be more tolerable for them in the day of judgment, Alma said, than for you. Moreover, he told the Ammonihites that it was, it, that it will profit them little to wait until the day of repentance. But now, even now, the Lord commands them to turn from their wicked ways, which he deliberately, which they deliberately seek, and trust in Him who is mighty to save. Alma told them, though not in these words, that they were putting the blessings of God to shame by partaking in sins of the gifts of his bounteous hands. They accepted rewards for works they should, but did not do. They quickly received of his gifts, but gave no thanks to the giver. In neglecting these things, Alma said that they had just cause to repent as commanded. And he further warned that unless they did so immediately and honestly, they would be swept off from the face of the earth, and their beautiful city, of which they were increasingly proud, also would be destroyed. Chapter 9, verses 15 through 24, the phrase, Great blessings bring great responsibilities. Alma warned that although the Lamanites were a wicked people at the time, the Lord would look more favorably upon them than upon the people of Ammonihah on the Day of Judgment. The Lamanites were following incorrect traditions that had been handed down to them, while the Nephites in general and the people of Ammonihah in particular had been a highly favored people of the Lord above every other nation, kindred, tongue, and people. With great blessings come great responsibilities.
And the rebelling against great blessings brings great cursings. Sister Sherry L. Du, then a counselor in the Relief Society, General Presidency taught, quote, unto whom much is given, much is required, and at times the demands of discipleship are heavy. But shouldn't we expect the journey towards eternal glory to stretch us? We sometimes rationalize our preoccupation with this world and our casual attempts to grow spiritually by trying to console each other with the notion that living the gospel really shouldn't require all that much of us. The Lord's standards of behavior will always be more demanding than the world's, but then the Lord's rewards are infinitely more glorious, including true joy, peace, and salvation. End of quote. To sin against light, to walk in the paths of wickedness when one had been enlightened by the Spirit, has enjoyed its gifts, and has been heir to the promise of the Almighty, is to place oneself in a precarious position. It represents the height of ingratitude. Truly, he who sins against the greater light shall receive the greater condemnation. Chapter 9, verses 25 through 29. The phrase for this cause that ye may not be destroyed. To avert the awful consequences of sin into which they had fallen, the Lord in his magnanimity sent an angel to many of his servants here below to go forth and cry, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The warning voices of God's inspired teachers and evangelists have sounded this call to every generation of his children, and so it was with the Ammonihites. Their iniquities have brought them nearer unto destruction. In the hardness of their hearts, they refused to listen to the urgent message Alma delivered. But Alma, now unmoved by their denial of truth and the diversion heaped upon him, steadfastly proclaimed the commission whereunto the angel had appointed and authorized him. Their salvation, not their destruction, was Alma's goal. He sought to save the people of Ammonia from an end so completely fatal to them that to bring to naught their wickedness, their destruction was inevitable. Their fair city and all they possessed came under this dictum. Alma's kite, repent ye, repent ye, was instantly important, mightily, and with a loud voice he called on the Ammonahites for immediate attention to God's command. Not many days hence, he cried, the Son of God shall come in his glory. We understand his glory to mean his body, the body which was begotten by God himself, his body filled with such divine qualities as grace, equity, and truth, overflowing with patience, mercy, and long-suffering. He would hear the cries of his people and would not scorn to answer their prayers nor think them unworthy. Many other things which had been told Alma by an angel concerning the Son of God were by him transmitted to the Ammonihaites. Each one carried a lesson and a command which was not to be ignored. He cometh to redeem those who will be baptized into repentance through faith on his name. That is a straightforward and complete answer to some who declared that repentance and baptism are separate and distinct from each other, and also that forgiveness of sin is not conditioned upon repentance. It is. The redemption brought about by Christ was Alma's great theme. Prepare the way of the Lord and make ready his path, was the message who proclaimed. Brothers and sisters, Christ's grace and mercy is not unconditional. It is conditional upon the conditions of repentance. Chapter 9, verse 30. The phrase, ye are my brethren, and you ought to be, and you ought to be beloved, meant they are his brothers and sisters in the sense they are the children of God, in the sense of Lehi, just as he is. They are not beloved in the sense of being bound together in that brotherly and sisterly love known only to the saint, faithful saints. In verse 30, the phrase, works which are meet for repentance, meant works which are equal to, worthy of, evidence of one's repentance. That is, Alma exhorts the people to repent of their sins so that the works of righteousness will flow from their regenerated hearts. The phrase, ye are a lost and a fallen people, meant people remain forever lost and fallen until they come unto Christ through forsaking their sins and putting off the natural man. Lehi taught that all mankind are lost and in a fallen state and never would be save they should rely on this Redeemer. 
Chapter 9, verses 31 through 34. When Alma had finished speaking, the multitude that had gathered about him became a mob of dis dissidents. All were angry with him because he termed them a hardened and stiff-necked people and a lost and fallen people. The guilty always take the truth to be hard. Some wanted to seize him and thrust him into prison. Others sought his life. But as it was before, the Lord did not permit any harm to befall his servant. The power of the great Jehovah was upon Alma, and none of his enemies could cope with his heaven-sent aid. In the midst of the tumult which the adversary stirred up against the missionaries, Amulek stepped forward and began to preach to the Ammonites the gospel of Christ. Here Mormon, the abridger of the account of Alma and Amalek, again notes that only a part of Amalek's words were written in this abridgment. Let's now go to chapter 10. 10 verse 2, the phrase, it was that same Abinadi who interpreted Ab Abinadi, who interpreted the writings which was upon the wall of the temple. This brief mention of Abinadi Aminadi, not Abinadi, Aminadi, interpreting the writings on the wall of the temple should not be confused with the episode recorded in Daniel 5, 13-28 in the Old Testament. Aminadi was a Nephite. We know nothing of this story beyond what Alma Lick here states. We assume that the account, must, which must have been fascinating, it is contained on the large plates of Nephi. Chapter 10, verse 3 phrase Lehi was a descendant of Manasseh. We know from earlier sources in our present book of that Lehi was a descendant of Joseph of old, but it is from the 116 page manuscript pages that become lost that had been translated from Mormon's abridgment of the book of Lehi that we learn specifics. Elorasta Snow explained in 1882, quote, the prophet Julius Smith informed us that the record of Lehi was contained on the 116 pages that were first translated and subsequently stolen, and of which an abridgment is given us in the first book of Nephi, which is the record of Nephi individually, he himself being of the lineage of Manasseh, but that Ishmael was the lineage of Ephraim, and that his sons married into Lehi's family, and Lehi's sons married Ishmael's daughters. So that's how Manasseh and Ephraim, both of Joseph's sons, get over here into the American continent. Prior to their flight to the wilderness, Lehi and Ishmael, both descendants of Joseph, lived with their families in Jerusalem, which was part of the kingdom of Judah. One writer suggested an explanation of why Lehi's ancestry, though descendants from Joseph, lived in Jerusalem, which for the most part was made up of the descendants of Judah. Some students of the Book of Mormon have wondered how descendants of Joseph were still living in Jerusalem in 600 BC when most members of the tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh were taken into captivity by the Assyrians around 721 BC. A scripture in Second Chronicles may provide a clue to this problem. This account mentions that in about 941 BC, Asa, the king of the land, gathered together at Jerusalem all of Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh. Second Chronicles 15.9 these strangers out of Ephraim and Manasseh who were gathered to Jerusalem as approximately 941 B.C. may have included the forefathers of Lehi and Ishmael. Chapter 10, verse 4, the phrase, I am also a man of no small reputation. Amulek was well known in the community and well to do. This is his way of saying, I am not exactly a nobody. You would do well to take heed, to take my words seriously. All these things Amulek's lineage and his community standing should have been a, should have had a bearing upon the treatment accorded to him by his fellow citizens at Ammonihah. Chapter 10, verse 5, the phrase, I have seen much of his mysteries and his marvelous powers. One assumes that Amulek had not been a bad man. He seems to have been a member of the church in that day, one who had witnessed the miraculous, had heard the truth preached numerous times, and seen God's hands working, but had not opened himself to the realm of divine experience. Chapter 10, verse 6, the phrase, no concerning these things, yet I would not know. Therefore, I went on rebelling against God, refers to. 
In spite of all the evidence of God's goodness and mercy that had been shown to him in the experience of the past, Amalek said that to them he had been blind. He had refused to listen to the Holy Spirit's promptings. He knew what was true, yet he remained unconvinced of its power. In short, Amalek rebelled against the good that was that which was holy. In the past, like many of his neighbors, his thoughts were upon the world and the things of the world. He found joy in worldly goods, but now all was changed. His heart, his head, his heart, and his whole being had suddenly been awakened to thoughts of God's kingdom. What only a short time before had been indifferent to now became the things he loved most. What once he loved, he now despised. Love for God's children and patience under trial were qualities that emerged from Amulek's great heart as the sun emerges from eclipse. The voice of the Lord calls to us regularly. It is not wickedness or carnality alone which keeps us from feeling and hearing the words. It is preoccupation. We need not be guilty of gross sin to be unready for the impressions of the Spirit. We need only to have our minds and hearts focused upon other things, to be so involved in the thick of thin things that we are not taking the time to ponder or meditate upon the matters of substance. Excessive labor in secondary causes leads to a lessening of spiritual opportunities. President Ezra Taft Benson told the following story which highlights the need for being attentive and open to heavenly guidance. Quote, Bishop John Wells, a former member of the presiding bishopric, was a great detailed man and was responsible for many church reports. President David O. McKay and President Harold B. Lee used to relate an experience from his life that is instructive to all of us. Here is the experience he relates. A son of Bishop and Sister Wells was killed in a railroad accident in Immigration Canyon, east of Salt Lake City. He was run over by a freight car. Sister Wells could not be consoled. She received no comfort during the funeral and continued her mourning after her son was laid to rest. Bishop Wells feared for her health as she was in a state of deep anguish. One day, soon after the funeral, Sister Wells was lying on her bed in a state of mourning. The son appeared to her and said, Mother, do not mourn, do not cry, I am all right. And then he related to her how the accident took place. Apparently there had been some question, even suspicion, about the accident because the young man was an experienced railroad man, but he told his mother that it was clearly an accident. He told her that as soon as he realized that he was in another sphere, he had tried to reach his father, but he could not. His father was so busy with the details of his office and work that he could not respond to the promptings. Therefore, the son had come to his mother. He then said, tell father that all is well with me, and I want you to not mourn anymore. President McKay used this experience to teach that we must always be responsive to the whisperings of the Spirit. These promptings come most often when we are not under the pressure of appointments and when we are not caught up in the worries of day-to-day -day life. Even we can get too busy in church work for the Spirit to get through. And we must be careful. Chapter 10, verse 10, the phrase, I know that these things whereof he hath testified are true. It is not enough for us to bear witness in a general way that the gospel is truth. We do not perfect our witness and we do not enjoy the fruits of pure testimony until we are able to bear witness that what we have taught is the truth. If a person has delivered an address on the law of tithing, it is appropriate and right for him to bear specific witness at the conclusion of the talk that tithing is a true principle and that the things he has said are verily true. And so on with regard to faith, repentance, and atonement, and rebirth, and chastity, and a myriad other topics we teach and then we testify. Chapter 10, verse 10, As the Lord liveth, referred to Amulek here swears with an oath that the teachings of Alma are true. This was the most serious, the most sacred manner of expression available at that time. So Alma swears, as the Lord liveth, Alma's testimony is true. Chapter 10, verses 12 through 32. 
One of the signs of moral decay of apostasy and corruption within a society is on emphasis on technicalities of law. This comes about when, in order to advance their cause, people seek to play the letter against the spirit of the law in effect to legalize sh sh chicanery. Among the pure in heart, God's laws are etched on the soul. They are found written in the countenances and inscribed on the inward parts. Among the perverse, however, law is a means of accomplishing the manipulation of others. Both anciently and in our day, own day, lawyers who seek to uphold the law, who strive to bring the lawless to account, who earnestly endeavor to protect the rights of all, these perform a valuable and appreciated service in society. On the other hand, when lawyers undertake to generate business for themselves by encouraged litigation in instances when patience and long-suffering would be more appropriate, when they cover up the truth, when their manipulations result in the guilty not being brought to justice, thereby penalizing and punishing the innocent, and when they employ the witchery of words or the sophistry of speech to deceive the unwary or the trusting, when they do such things, they have become Become pawns in the hands of the father of all lies. They have sold their souls. Amulek stated the matter simply. The foundation of the destruction of this people is beginning to be laid by the unrighteousness of your lawyers and your judges. Chapter 10, verse 17 through 21, the phrase, They knew not that Amulek could know of their designs. As they began to question him, Amulek perceived their intentions. The Spirit of the Lord was with him, and immediately he parried, he parried their thrust. He turned their questions into barbed retorts in which he showed their iniquities. Boldly and with a case that was just, Amulek again called the wicked to repentance. He testified that Christ himself had said by the voice of his angel, I will come down among my people with equity and justice in my hands. Therefore Amulek said, as also had angels, Repent ye, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That the Ammonites, to excuse their ways of darkness, could not plead ignorance to God's laws, Amulek warned them that they, if they persisted in evil doing, casting out from them the righteous, entering the secret pay of Satan, thereby defiantly repelling God's Holy Spirit and their boasting of unrighteousness, they would become ripe for destruction. Of all these things, the people of Ammonihah were guilty. They chose iniquity. The righteous tradition of their fathers were by them obscured. In the case of Ammon Amalek, they sought to make it a crime, punishable by death, to preach God's holy word. So when these people finally get destroyed, it is because they chose that, brothers and sisters. It's not because God is angry at them, even though we refer to his justice as God's anger or his wrath. But he only brings his wrath and anger and judgments on people because that's what they choose by the use of their agency in wickedness. So what the Ammonihai receive is what they desired. They received the fruits of wickedness, which was the destruction of them and their city. By the trumped-up charges of which the lawyers accused the missionaries, the lawyers themselves, the sacred record says, are laying the foundation of the devil, for ye are laying traps and snares to catch the holy ones of God. In short, the lawyers together with the judges who perverted their callings were thus building upon an unfirm foundation, the superstructure of which would sooner or later crumble under the weight of sin and bring down the wrath of God upon your heads, even the destruction of this people, again, by their choosing. Chapter 10, verse 22 through 23, the phrase, prayers of the righteous. Note the effect that the prayers of the righteous had upon a nation. The prayers of the righteous also kept the Nephites from being destroyed later during the days of Captain Moroni and Samuel the Lamanite. President Spencer W. Kimball said the following about prayers offered in our day, quote, there are many upright and faithful who live all the commandments and whose lives and prayers keep the world from destruction. End of quote. That is a powerful concept and sentence. Once the righteous were destroyed or removed from Ammoniah, the prayers of the righteous ceased to protect the city and every living soul of Ammonahites was destroyed. 
Chapter 10, verse 23, in his fierce anger. Prepare ye, prepare ye for that which is to come, for the Lord is nigh. And the anger of the Lord is kindled, and his sword is bathed in heaven, and it shall fall upon the inhabitants of the earth. That's from Doctrine and Covenants, section 1. His fierce anger, the anger of the Lord, is just Christ's use of righteous justice. Meaning, because the people chose wickedness, they now choose to be destroyed. It's his righteous use of justice and judgment. Chapter 10, verses 24 through 30. The phrase, Now it came to pass that the people were more angry with Amulek. As Amulek pressed his charges against their corruption, the Ammonahites grew more and more angry because of his insistence that they walked in crooked paths. They reviled him and mocked his warning words. In spite of the threats they made against him, he nevertheless remained calmed and patient under trial. He neither reviled against the reviler, nor did he smite the smiter. This is good examples for us when we come across apostates people. But Amulek was firm in his pronouncement, O ye wicked and perverse generation, why has Satan got such great hold upon your hearts? He said, in, this, in their ignorance and infatuation, their pride and folly, the people of Ammonihah did not understand the things of God. They refused to acknowledge guilt. Their hearts were set upon the things of the world. Chapter 11 Chapter 11, verse 4 through 19, the phrase, Now these are the names of the different pieces of their gold and of, of their silver according to their value. These verses seem to describe not a group of Nephite coins, but rather a system of weights and measures by which to establish various degrees of monetary worth. It appears that at the time of the establishment of the reign of the judges by King Mosiah, a standardized system of weights and measures was put into effect throughout the land of the Nephites. Chapter 11, verse 22, the phrase, Yea, if it be according to the Spirit of the Lord, referred to, those called to speak and act in the name of the Lord are careful in their ministry. They have no private agenda, no favorite doctrines, no special lessons they seek to put forth according to the whim of the moment. Rather, they strive earnestly to be in tune with the Spirit which teaches and shows a person what he or she must do at all times. They speak the words of Christ, meaning they speak by the power of the Holy Ghost, and thereby make known only that which the Lord would have made known. Thus they answer only the questions that seem appropriate at the time, and deliver that portion of the word which is needful for the edification of those they serve. Chapter 11, verse 22, the phrase, Six aunties of silver. An auntie was the greatest monetary value in Nephite society. This is probably why the inclusion of the Nephite coinage in Enamel 11 to demonstrate the extent of the bribe Zeezrom offered if Amulek would deny the existence of the Supreme Being. It appears that six aunties of silver was the equivalent of 42 days' wages for a judge in the society of the people of Ammoniah. And so that's why we probably have that monetary system in there, just so that when he says, I'll give you six aunties of silver, we know that he is offering a very lucrative sum of money for Amulek to deny his testimony. Chapter 11, verse 24, the phrase, Thou knowest there is a God, but thou lovest that lucre more than God, referred to. Amulek has discerned the soul and the intents of Zeezrom, of the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, who gave heed to the words of Satan, the scriptures say, they love Satan more than God. It is not necessarily true that they did not feel a love for God. They may have, but they love Satan more. And so it is with money, that filthy lucre of which the scriptures speak. It isn't that some members of the faith do not love God. They probably do. They just love this world's goods more. And so Alma discerned that Zeezrom would not give over the money if Amulek denounced his testimony. He was just using that as a bribe, and he was going to keep it anyway. And Amulek exposes his defraudment that he was about to commit. Chapter 11, verses 26 through 33. 
This is a discussion, a question and answer session that could be difficult to follow. Zizram, in his eagerness to trap Amalek in his own words, asked whether there is more than one God. Amalek answered, there is not. Amalek is, of course, speaking entirely of the Savior, of the Lord Jehovah. He is not making reference to our Father in Heaven or to the Godhead. That same Jehovah had spoken anciently to Isaiah, I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. Zizron then asks whether it is the Son of God who will come as the Messiah, to which Amulek answers simply, Yea. From the crafty lawyer's perspective at this point, it would appear that Amulek is contradicting himself. But in fact, the Nephite missionary is delivering a profound truth. Jesus Christ is both God and Son of God. Is there only one God? Yes, there is only God, one God, who shall come to take away the sins of the world and ransom fallen men and women from the temporal and spiritual death brought into the world by the fall of Adam. And so that's what Amalek is referring to when Caesar asks, is there only one God? And he says, yes. He's referring to the one God, Jehovah, Jesus Christ, who will atone for the sins of mankind. He is not making reference to the Godhead. Chapter 11, verses 34 through 37. The phrase, shall he save his people in their sins? Or that question. Even the omnipotent one, the Lord Jehovah, cannot save people in their sins. He came on a search and rescue mission to save people from their sins. But no one, not the least and lowliest of mankind, or the mightiest apostle prophet, can be saved in sin. Such is the divine, the divine decree. Speaking of Amulek, Zizram encountered, Nephi later said, For he said unto him that the Lord surely should come to redeem his people, but that he should not come to redeem them in their sins, but to redeem them from their sins. And he has power given unto him from the Father to redeem them from their sins because of repentance. Chapter 11, verses 38 through 39, the phrase is the Son of God, the very eternal Father, refers to Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Father of heaven and earth, the creator of all things from the beginning. He is Father and He is Son, depending on which of His roles and functions we are viewing at the time. In short, Amulek is declaring that Christ is the God who should come, that he is the Son of God, and that he is the Father of heaven and earth. Did he not create the heaven and the earth? And are we not also the children of Christ because of his resurrection and that we gain life? In that way, he becomes a father to us also. Chapter 11, verse 40, the phrase, Whom does the atonement cover? There is often a misunderstanding in 1140. Some people have thought that Amulek was teaching that Christ suffered only for those who believed and repent. This is not correct. The scriptures tell us that the Savior suffered the pains of all men, yea, the pains of every living creature, both men, women, and children. If mankind will not repent, however, the Savior indicates that my blood shall not cleanse them. Clearly, what Amulek was intending to convey is the fact that the atonement is, in part, may go unused when the wicked choose not to repent, not that the Savior only suffered for those who would repent. His suffering and atonement are efficacious, however, only for those who repent and come unto him. Though thus to refuse to repent is to mock his plan and shun his offerings, especially when he has suffered for you and you shun it. That is certainly mockery. Chapter 11, verses 41 through 45, the phrase, the day cometh that all shall raise from the dead. The Bible dictionary finds the resurrection as the uniting of a spirit with body, with a body of flesh and bones, never again to be divided. Knowledge of the resurrection adds greater meaning to mortal life and helps us make better decisions with our agency if we know we're going to be judged and held accountable. Dallin, Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles described the lively hope that comes to individuals who possess faith and trust in his sacred truth and the impact it can have on the day-to-day -day living 
quote, the lively hope we are given by the resurrection is our conviction that death is not the conclusion of our identity, but merely a necessary step in the de destined transition from mortality to immortality. This hope changes the whole perspective of mortal life. The assurance of resurrection gives us the strength and perspective to endure the mortal challenges faced by each of us and by those we love. Such things as physical, mental, or emotional deficiencies we bring with us at birth or acquire during mortal life. Because of the res resurrection, we know that these mortal deficiencies are only temporary. The assurance of resurrection also gives us a powerful incentive to keep the commandments of God during our mortal lives. Moreover, unless our mortal sins have been cleansed and blotted out by repentance and forgiveness, we will be resurrected with a bright recollection and a perfect knowledge of all our guilt and our uncleanliness. The seriousness of that reality is emphasized by the many scriptures suggesting that the resurrection is followed immediately by the final judgment. Truly, this life is the time for men to prepare to meet God. Our sure knowledge of a resurrection of immortality also gives us the courage to face our own death, even a death that we might call premature. The assurance of immortality also helps us bear the mortal separations involved in the death of our loved ones. We should all praise God for the assured resurrection that makes our mortal separation temporary and gives us the hope and strength to carry on. End of Elder Oaks's quote. While serving as a member of the 70, Elder Sterling W. Sill described some of the blessings of the resurrection when he taught that a resurrection body, quote, is beautiful beyond all comprehension, which quicken, with quickened senses amplify powers of perception and vastly increase capacity for love, understanding, and happiness, end of quote. Oh, we have so much to learn after the resurrection, don't we, brothers and sisters? President Joseph Fielding Smith also explained that the resurrection would, what the resurrection would do to our physical bodies, quote, there is no reason for any person to be concerned as to the appearance of individuals in the resurrection. Death is a purifying process as far as the body is concerned. We have reason to believe that the appearance of old age will disappear and the body will be restored with the full vigor of manhood and womanhood. Children will arise as children, for there is no growth in the grave. Children will continue to grow until they reach the full stature of their spirits. End of quote. Now our last chapter, Alma, chapter 12. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, the phrase, the words of Amulek silenced Zizram. Alma, had, perceiving that Zizram had been silenced by the words of Amulek, and that Zizram was caught in the trap he had set for Amulek, and further that the lies of Zizram, seeking to destroy the missionaries, were brought to naught by the Holy Spirit, began more fully to explain to Zizram the scriptures pertaining to the atonement of the Son of God, his resurrection, and salvation in God's kingdom. Amulek had opened new vistas of Zizram's vision, and now Alma enlarged Zizram's prospect, prospect by quoting the words of other prophets about whom Zizram already knew. Verse 2, while Alma spoke directly in Zizram's ears, his words were heard by numer num numbers of the multitude who had gathered about them, not in anger, nor in the spirit of reprisal, but for a moment Alma, whom Zizram accused, became the accuser. Verse 3, Alma let the great throng that clustered around them know that Zizram had misled them by his lying, and had not only lied to them, but to God, who knew all his innermost thoughts. Alma drew to Zizram's attention, and thus to that of the multitude, the fact that Zizram's thoughts were made known to the missionaries by this God's spirit which was in them. Verse 4, Zizram could not hide his thoughts and his designs against the servants of God by covering up his intentions in robes of public service, which he attempted so to do. 
Zizorm hoped to entrap Alan Amalek in a labyrinth of inconsistent and opposing doctrines. He had craftily designed a plan of questioning which he thought would confuse the Lord's servants, but his visionary scheme backfired. It cleared away in front of the missionaries that by their answers to his questions, they were able to proclaim the word of the Lord without let or hindrance from him. His mental acuteness and physical strength made Zizram a bold and ingenuous advocate of whatsoever cause he espoused. But however, in publicly denouncing Alman Amalek, his utmost strength was proved to be absolute weakness and his greatest wisdom but foolishness. Verse 5, He hath exercised his power in thee, meant Satan need not do all his own dirty work. He moves upon, tempts, inspires, and possesses others to cause them to think and act in ways that seek to halt or hinder the plan of righteousness. However, as Joseph Smith taught, the devil has no power over us only as we permit him. Verse 6, all of this was a part of the plan of Satan, to snare the people and bring them into subjection, to, bring, to him and bring them into captivity. Verse 7, Zizram began to fear and tremble because the missionaries were able to tell his very thoughts. The manner of his life was laid bare before him, and in it he saw the duplicity of his motives and the blackness of his heart. He became so afraid, for we imagine, he had hid there are some follies which would fain forget, and in intrepidation, lest Alma and Amalek should reveal them, he trembled more and more at the prospect. He saw and realized that the light that surrounded Alma and Amalek was the light of truth, and the power he was combating was the power of God. His heart began to acknowledge its guilt. In verse 8, we see in this verse an example of the marvelous transformation that can begin to take place because of the power of the word. Zizorm, only a short time before, had been asked baiting, trapping, trapping questions. Now that he is confronted by the power of God and having his sins laid open to view, his queries begin to change to reflect a type of sincere inquiry after the truth. In the language of the scriptures, he has been born again to see the kingdom of God. He asks concerning Amalek's words on the resurrection of the dead, a matter which is strange, unfathomable, and indeed mysterious to those who spurn the ways of God. Chapter 12, I'm sorry, that should be chapter 12, verse, verse 9. What uh, the phrase, what are the mysteries of God? Or the question, what are the mysteries of God? President Joseph Finley Smith explained that the mysteries of God are simply those divine principles of the gospel necessary for our salvation that are not understood by the world. So anything that we have to have revealed to us, whether there is a God, whether Christ is his son, whether Joseph Smith is a prophet, whether the Book of Mormon truths, those are all mysteries of God until they are revealed. The Lord has promised to reveal his mysteries to those who serve him faithfully. The gospel is very simple so that even children at the age of accountability may understand it. Without question, there are principles which in this life we cannot understand. But when the fullness comes, we shall see that all is plain and reasonable and within our comprehension. The simple principles of the gospel, such as baptism and the atonement, are mysteries to those who do not have the guidance of the Spirit of the Lord. End of quote. The mysteries of God should not be confused with the unworthy pursuit of mysteries or things that God has not revealed. Speaking of this latter use of the word mysteries, Elder Bruce R. McConkie, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained, quote, There is also a restricted and limited usage of the expression mysteries. It is more of a co colloquial than a scriptural usage. And it has reference to the body of teachings in the speculative field, those things which the Lord has not revealed in plainness in this day. It is to these things that reference is made when the elders are counseled to leave the mysteries alone. Those things that we speculate and God has not revealed, we are to leave alone until he sees fit to reveal them. Chapter 9 12, verse 9, the phrase, Nevertheless, they are laid under strict command. They shall not impart only according to the portion of his word, which he doth grant unto the children of men. 
In other words, we are to keep sacred things sacred and only share them as directed by the Holy Ghost. Brigham Young, President Brigham Young, gave the following counsel, quote, Should you receive a vision or revelation from the Almighty, one that the Lord gave you concerning yourself or this people, but which you are not to reveal on account of your not being the proper person, or because it ought not be known by the people at present, you should shut it up and seal it as closed and lock it as tight as heaven is in you, and make it as secret as, secret as the grave. The Lord has no confidence in those who reveal secrets, for he cannot safely reveal himself to such persons. The man who cannot know things without telling any other living being upon the earth, who cannot keep his secrets and those that God reveals him, never can receive the voice of his Lord to dictate him and the people on this earth. If we reveal spiritual things in a ta fast and testimony meeting, in a class that should not be shared because of their sacredness, brothers and sisters, then God will stop revealing things to us. He cannot trust us. Be careful with what you share in testimony meetings, in personal conversations with people, and in Sunday school class or priesthood or whatever. Only share that which the Spirit tells you that you can share. There is one principle that I wish the people would understand and lay to heart just as fast as you will prove before your God that you are worthy to receive the mysteries, if you please to call them so, of the kingdom of heaven, that you are full of confidence in God, that you will never betray a thing that God tells you, that you will never reveal to your neighbor that which ought not be revealed as quick as you prepare to be entrusted with the things of God. There is an eternity of them to bestow upon you. Instead of pleading with the Lord to bestow more upon you, plead within yourselves to have confidence in yourselves, to have integrity in yourselves, and know when to speak and what to speak, what to reveal, and how to carry yourselves and walk before the Lord. And just as fast as you prove to Him that you will preserve everything secret that ought to be, that you will deal out to your neighbor all which you ought and no more, and learn how to dispense your knowledge to your families friends, neighbors, and brethren, the Lord will bestow upon you and give unto you and bestow upon you until finally he will say to you, ye shall never fall, your salvation is sealed unto you. Ye are sealed up unto eternal life and salvation through your integrity. That was a quote from Brigham Young. Chapter 12, verses 10 through 11, the phrase, we receive the lesser portion of the word when we harden our hearts. That meant the Alan H. Oaks explained that if we re reject revelation through the Holy Ghost, we limit how much we can learn. We teach and learn the mysteries of God by revelation from His Holy Spirit. If we harden our hearts to revelation and limit our understanding to what we can obtain by study and reason, we are limited to what Alma called the lesser portion of the Word. Those who cry out, I have enough. Those who refuse to learn more. Those who are content to exist at their present level of light and truth, who say essentially, thus far and no further, these shall live and die in ignorance of the mysteries of God and shall thereby subject themselves to the chains of hell. God is gracious. He provides for us that which we are willing and thus able to receive. End of quote. Chapter 12, verses 12 through 14. Judge according to our words, works, and thoughts, it means Elder Daniel H. Oaks taught that the judgment is not merely a review of actions taken in mortality, but is instead an assessment of who and what we have become as a result of our actions. Quote, the prophet Nephi describes the final judgment in terms of what we have become, and if their works have been filthiness, then they must needs be filthy. And if they be filthy, it must needs be that they cannot dwell in the kingdom of God. Moroni declared, He that is filthy shall be filthy still, and he that is righteous shall be righteous still. The same would be true of selfishness or disobedience or any other personal attribute inconsistent with the requirements of God. Referring to the state of the wicked in the final judgment, Alma explains that if we are condemned by our words, our works, and our thoughts, we shall not be found spotless, and in this awful state we shall not dare look up to our God. From such teachings, we conclude that the final judgment is not just an evaluation of the sum of total of good and evil acts, 
what we have done. It is an acknowledgement of the final effect of our acts and thoughts, what we have become. It is not enough for anyone just to go through the motions, just to do, brothers and sisters. Our doing must lead to becoming. Back to the quote, the commandments, ordinances, and covenants of the gospel are not a list of deposits required to be made in some heavenly account. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a plan that shows us how to become what our Heavenly Father desires us to become. End of quote. Verse 14. He is just in all his works. Not only will our actions here upon earth condemn us, but even our thoughts, when we shall be called to stand before God to be judged for all our works, and we remember our shortcomings as if they were yesterday, our wicked desires and follies, all of which will be crushing, they, in contrast to falling rocks and mountains, which would cover us from his view, would be more painful to our hearts. Chapter 12, verse 15. I'm sorry, that other 15 <clears throat> doesn't need to be there. The phrase, acknowledge that all his judgments are just, meant in the day of judgment following the resurrection, there will be no disputing to one's goodness or one's eternal station. In that day when we shall see as we are seen and known as we are known, every person shall be confronted with what he or she has become. No facade, no pretense, no sham. We shall face up to truth, diamond truth, truth which will be sharper than a two-edged sword. But notwithstanding our desires to be hid from him, we, every one, must stand before him in his glory and in his power, in his might, majesty, dominion, and acknowledge to our everlasting shame that all his judgments are just. We, then, will see that our God has power, that in his mercy he not only can but will save to life everlasting and light all them that have faith on his name and bring forth fruit fit for one who has truly repented. Chapter 12, verse 16, the phrase, Then cometh a death, even a second death. We will let Jacob, the brother of Nephi, the son of Lehi, and Samuel the Lamanite, comment on this verse. He said, O my brethren, hearken unto my words, arouse your faculties of your soul, shake yourselves that you may awake from the slumber of death, and lose yourselves from the pains of hell, that you may not become angels to the devil, but to be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But behold, the resurrection of Christ redeemeth mankind, yea, even all mankind, and bringeth them back into the presence of the Lord. Yea, it bringeth to pass the conditions of repentance. And whosoever repenteth, the same is not hewn down and cast into the fire. But whoso repenteth, not is hewn down and cast into the fire. And there cometh upon them again a spiritual death, yea, a second death, for they are cut off, cut off again as to things pertaining to righteousness. Therefore, repent ye, repent ye, lest ye knowing these things and not doing them, ye shall suffer yourselves to come under condemnation, and you are brought down unto this second death. The second death is then after being judged, we are cut off from God's presence again, and we can no longer dwell in his presence because we chose poorly. 12, chapter 12, verse 17, the phrase, Their torment shall be as a lake of fire and brimstone. The suffering to which the wicked are subject takes place in the post-mortal spirit world. This is hell, both a place and a state of mind. Concerning hell as a state of mind, Joseph Smith explained, quote, A man is his own tormentor and his own condemner. Hence the saying, They shall go into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. The torment of disappointment in the mind of man is as exquisite as the lake of burning with fire and brimstone. End of quote. Chapter 12, verse 13, 18, the phrase, they shall be as though there had been no redemption made, refers to, for all except the sons of perdition, this suffering is eternal only in the sense that it is God's suffering and he is eternal. It will come to an end at the time of the second resurrection at the end of the millennium. So those going to the Telestial Kingdom will suffer but will be resurrected into a kingdom of glory, that of the Telestial Kingdom. 
the sons of perdition, those who have known the power of goodness of God, and then who deny and defy that power, shall indeed suffer in out of darkness forever. Those, for those who reject the gospel and sneer at its saving power, it is as though there had been no redemption made, as though Christ had never come into the world, as though there had been a fall, but no hope for deliverance from it. Chapter verses 20 through 21, the phrase there was one, Antiana, who came forth. Antiana's query is actually a valid one. If, according to the earliest scriptural accounts, God prevented Adam and Eve in Eden from taking the fruit of the tree of life and thereby preventing them from living immortality forever, why would Alan Amnick speak of the gospel plan as a means whereby men and women could live forever through Christ? Alma, of course, will explain that God did not desire our first parents to live forever in their fallen, unredeemed condition, but rather made known a plan whereby they could be made ready after a life of mortality to enter through Christ into resurrected immortality. See, if Al Adam and Eve, after partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and have fallen, then immediately partook the tree of life, they would live forever in a fallen and lost condition. That's why God keeps them from partaking of the tree of life. They needed a probationary state where they could prove to God their worthiness and repent of their fallen nature. Chapter 12, verse 22. By this phrase, by his fall, a man can become lost in a fallen people. This is a hard doctrine, one from which too many Latter-day Saints tend to flee. It is the doctrine that Lehi taught that Benjamin declared that Abinadi made known, that the brother of Jerophi professed. It is the burden of Scripture, particularly the Book of Mormon. Adam fell, his posterity fell with him, in the sense that all the accounting, no one accepted, became, through conception, subject to a fallen nature, a nature which must be put off through sincere repentance unto Christ. Though we are not heir to an original sin, a taint that many Christians think and tell upon the posterity of Adam and Eve as a result of their disobedience, we are subject to the fall and thereby in dire need of redemption. In fact, the fall and the atonement are a package deal, a joint doctrine. There is no place in the Book of Mormon where the atonement of Christ is taught, wherein the fall of Adam is not also taught or implied. If there had been no fall, there would have been no need for atonement. This is true on an individual as well as a cosmic basis. Chapter 12, verses 23 through 24. The fruit which God had commanded Adam not to eat of grew in the Garden of Eden. Nearby was the tree of life, which also flourished in the garden. Adam broke God's commandment and partook of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. At that same time that God gave Adam that commandment, he admonished him, saying, If thou shalt and if, thou, and if thou eat, thou shalt surely die. Adam was no doubt in a quandary. He had partaken of that which was forbidden. He had brought upon himself and his children the penalty of disobedience. If he now should eat of the fruit of the tree of life, he would live forever in his fallen state, thereby making the word of God to no effect, making God a liar, Alma said. Because remember, he said, when you eat, you shall die. That's why he cannot partake of the tree of life, because then he would live forever, and I would make God a liar. Now, you need to know the truth concerning what took place in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve had been tutored, taught the gospel plan of salvation by Jehovah and Elohim in the Garden of Eden. They knew the plan. They knew that if they wanted to have children and further God's plan, that they had to then partake of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, or they could not have any children. So Adam and Eve partake knowing what they are doing. The only reason why they're kicked out of the garden is to stay in the garden. The law said you should not eat of the tree because the day you eat of it is the day that you are then separated from God and you must then enter mortality. That's all that is taking place here. God gives them a choice. Stay in the garden and the two of you will stay forever and the plan will never go in a process or partake of the fruit of the tree and you become of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and you will become mortal, lost and a fallen people, but I will provide a savior for you. 
whereby you can return unto me, and thereby you may also be able to have children and further the plan. So that's all that's going in the garden. Elohim is just giving Adam and Eve a choice in which direction. Stay in the Garden of Eden, just the two of them, or partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and thereby being able to have children, become fallen, and then use the atonement and a probationary state of mortality to repent and become saved. God promised death to the transgressor. The tree of life offered one who partook of its fruit a never-ending existence in his sin, subject to pain, sweat, and tears, and all the infirmities that a man attend mankind, except he could not escape them through death, because for him there would be no death. The penalty pronounced by Adam, God upon Adam that thou shalt surely die conflicted with the tree's inviting assurance, thou shalt live forever. To prevent Adam and Eve to prevent Adam and his wife, Eve, from partaking of its fruit, which in so doing they would live forever in their fallen condition, the Lord put guards between the man and the tree. As Amulek had noted in his previous sermon, the temporal body of man is destroyed by death. Death is a separation of the body and the flesh and blood from the spirit of man. Before that separation occurs, there is a time appointed wherein man can prepare to meet his God. That time is now. This mortal life is a probationary state whereby man can make himself ready to enjoy a life in the presence of God, which is the endless state of which we have spoken, Alma said. That endless state is after the resurrection of man, or after the reuniting of the soul has taken place. The term probationary state or probationary time is a phrase used only by Alma in the Book of Mormon. Elder L. Tom Perry, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, described this probationary time as, quote, The main purpose of our life is to allow our spirits, which existed before the world was, to be united with our bodies for a time of great opportunity in mortality. The association of the two together has given us the privilege of growing, developing, and maturing as only we can with spirit and body united. With our bodies, we pass through a certain amount of trial in what is termed a probationary state of our existence. This is a time of learning and testing to prove ourselves worthy of eternal opportunities. It is all part of a divine plan our Father has for His children. End of quote. Chapter 12, verse 25, the phrase, the plan of redemption, which was laid from the foundation of the world. The plan of salvation that which we know as the gospel of Jesus Christ is in reality the plan of the Father, the gospel of God. It was preached in its terms and conditions, including the creation, the fall, and the atonement, were known and put into effect before the world was made. We were taught about the creation, there would be a fall, and there would be an atonement long before this world was created in our pre-earth life. Had it not been for a kind and wise Heavenly Father, who seeth all things, who knoweth all things, both present, past, and things yet to come, and who, in addition, provides for the needs of the children, there could have been no resurrection, no plan of redemption. Chapter 12, verse 26, the phrase, it were possible that our first parents could have gone forth and partaken of the tree of life, they would have been forever miserable refers to, if Adam and Eve had been permitted to partake of the fruit of the tree of life before living out their mortal lives, meaning right after they partook of the knowledge of good and evil, they would have been taken into immortality without the experience, the pains, the struggles, the opportunities to overcome the posterity and thus the joys of this life. They would have been damned in their progress, and the rest of us would have known no progress. We would have remained forever as unembodied spirits. Redemption means, one, to buy again something that has been sold by paying back the price that bought it, and two, to, to deliver and bring out of bondage those who were kept prisoners by their enemies. Cruden's Concordance of the Bible, this is where that comes from, by sin came death, sin, it may be said, purchased it. The plan of redemption provided the price which was paid for it be given back. What was that price? Demand was made for death to deliver up all those who were in its bondage or in its relentless grasp. The ransom was high. 
Only God himself could pay it. He alone could meet the prescribed terms. The plan of redemption provided beforehand that he would pay the price, even death to loose the bands of hell. The blood which was shed on Calvary's hill was the price that he paid. The redemption brought about by Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And also it had the blood that was shed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Chapter 12, verse 27, the phrase, But it was appointed unto men that they must die. Man, notwithstanding the evil designs of Satan, the plan of God triumphed. Lucifer, the enemy of Christ and all that is good, struggled vainly to bring the purposes of God to naught. He it was who sought to frustrate God's plan of salvation. He would have all of God's children dwell forever in misery, being subject to the will of the devil. But in spite of Satan's cunning and purpose of God rolled on, God's word was sure. It did not fail. Satan also knew the plan of salvation and knew that there had to be a fall. And so it begs the question, why did he tempt him to partake of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of evil, which would bring about the fall, which would bring about the plan of salvation? Satan knew that was a guard of God's plan. I believe that what he was up to is that he was going to get them to eat that, they become fallen, and then he would immediately try to get them to eat of the knowledge of tree of life and therefore live forever in their sins. But God, knowing Satan's mind, stopped that and immediately put a guard around the tree of life and kept them from partaking of that. If they would have, if Satan could have gotten them from partaking of that tree of life, that certainly would have frustrated God's plan. And so death came upon all mankind. God decreed that after death and the resurrection therefrom, all men must stand before a higher judge than man and their answer for what he did while on earth or when in that probationary state of which Alma and Amalek testified. Chapter 12, verse 28 through 29, in the phrase, God sent angels to converse with men. After God had appointed that death should come to mankind, and that likewise a resurrection of bodies of men held captive by the grave, he decreed the day of judgment in which we live in our resurrection vision should stand before his bar and make an accounting of our actions while in mortality, so that man should be fully informed concerning God's purposes in establishing death, the resurrection, and the day of judgment, which all men must take part in his wisdom. He saw that it was wise for them to know the reason, therefore, and sent holy angels to converse with them. That's why he sent the angels to Adam after he has fallen, and is now in the fallen world, to teach the gospel so that they could prepare themselves for the day of judgment. These heavenly messengers sent from God's presence were commissioned by him to minister unto the children of men, making known unto them the power and authority of God, the plan of redemption, and his great love. From that moment, man began to see the goodness of God, the glorious majesty of his presence, and the wisdom of his word. As Moses 5.58 states, And thus the gospel began to be preached in the beginning, being declared by holy angels, sent forth from the presence of God, and by his own voice, and by the gift of the Holy Ghost. Chapter 12, verse 30, the phrase, And they began from that time forth to call, up, to call upon his name. Heavenly manifestations were man's constant guide. Men were taught to pray to God, to reject on his to rely on his justice and mercy to do his will. And as much as they did so, they were rewarded with greater knowledge of the plan of redemption. Chapter 12, verse 31 through 32, the phrase, Wherefore he gave commandments unto men. Verse 31, Man, having transgressed the laws of God, partaking of the forbidden fruit, thereby became as gods, knowing good from evil. They were empowered by committing that same act to tell right and wrong and to choose the good. Discretion to this end increased within them. Not only did they see and recognize the truth, but they also had the power to act according to their wills and prayer, whether to do good or to do evil. So we had agency, and the power to use that agency was given to us. Verse 32, God, seeing their mental and spiritual growth, gave men commandments with which they were bidden to comply. Obedience brought forth the blessings of heaven. Neglect or refuse to obey the wrath of God. 
Gradually, he that chooses iniquity chooses the evil way. He becomes oblivious to God's commandments and sees darkness where there is light. The penalty of such willful disobedience is death, not death of the body of flesh and blood, and blood, for that came by transgression of our first parents, but a death, a second death, which was an everlasting death as things pertaining to righteousness. Such a man prefers darkness to light because we are told his deeds are evil. No evil can enter God's presence, and the doer thereof is equally banned. Of him there is no redemption. The justice of God cannot be less violated. The supreme goodness of God cannot be made an excuse for evil or any of its component parts. President Boyd K. Packer, president of the Quorum of Twelve Apostles, taught that knowledge of God's plan provides answers to difficult questions. Speaking to teachers of youth, he said, Young people wonder why. Why are we commanded to do some things? and Why are we commanded not to do other things? A knowledge of the plan of happiness, even an outline form, can give your minds a why. Most of the difficult questions we face in the church right now, and we could list them, abortion and all the rest of them, all of the challenges of who holds the priest and who does not, can be answered without some knowledge, cannot be answered without some knowledge of the plan as a background. Alma said this, and this is, I think of late my favorite scripture, although I change now and again. God gave unto them commandments after having made known unto them the plan of redemption. If you are trying to give students a why, follow that pattern. God gave unto them commandments after having made known unto them the plan of redemption. End of quote. If we understand the plan, then we understand why God tells us to do or not to do certain things. Chapter 12, verse 34, the phrase, he shall have claim on mercy. Mercy is not unconditional, as Alma states, and now the plan of mercy could not be brought about except an atonement should be made. Therefore, God himself atones for the sins of the world to bring about the plan of mercy, to appease the demands of justice, that God might be a perfect, just God and a merciful God also. Chapter 12, verse 36, the first provocation. This is a reference to the refusal of ancient Israelites under Moses to receive the further light and knowledge when the lawgiver sought to give them, including the fullness of the blessings of the priesthood, and thus the privilege of coming into the divine presence. And this greater priesthood administer the gospel and holds the keys of the mysteries of the kingdom, even the key of the knowledge of God. Therefore, in the ordinances thereof, the power of godliness is manifest and without the ordinances thereof and the authority of the priesthood, the power of godliness is not manifest unto the men in the flesh. For without this, the power of godliness, no man can see the face of God, even the Father, and live. Now this Moses plainly taught the children of Israel in the wilderness, and they sought diligently to sink and and sought diligently to sanctify his people, that they might behold the face of God. But they hardened their hearts and could not endure his presence. Therefore the Lord in his wrath, for his anger was kindled against them, swore that they should not enter into his rest while in the wilderness, which rest is the fullness of his glory. Therefore Moses had to go back upon the mount, and he got the law of Moses, a lesser law as a schoolmaster to bring them into Christ. So the first provocation is when the children of Israel rejected the laws of the Melchizedek priesthood and the ordinances of the temple. They were not ready for that. They rejected it by their actions when he came down off the mount and they were worshiping the golden calf. So that's the first provocation. Therefore, Christ had to keep the higher law of the Melchizedek priesthood from them and give them a lesser law, the law of Moses. The last provocation would be when the children of Israel murmured when given the report of the land of Canaan being populated with many people, and thus they were afraid to go into the promised land and conquer it with the help of Jehovah. Remember, Moses sent into the promised land 12 men and they came back 
10 with an evil report that there was it was a land of, of good and plenty and food and lush, but their people were many as grasshoppers and we could never defeat them. They had lake, they lacked faith in Christ, in Jehovah. Two, Caleb and Joshua, the only two, said, no, let us go up. God will be our help. Thus, that generation had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until they were all dead. And the next generation were then faithful in place, in placing their trust in Jehovah and went into the land of Canaan to seek to conquer it according to the word of God. So the last provocation was the children of Israel provoking God to make them wander 40 years in the wilderness to die out because they did not have faith to go into the promised land and conquer the Canaanites. They did not have enough faith in Jehovah. Chapter 12, verse 37, the phrase that we provoke not the Lord our God meant, as you see, I'm reminded them, death of the mortal body came upon man through disobedience to God's laws. Do not provoke him by further disobedience to send upon you a second death, which is the everlasting destruction of your souls, from which there can be no redemption made. Alma thus concluded, Brothers and sisters, when we disobey God and turn to our wicked ways and seek to do what we want to do, we are then provoking God to bring his justice and judgments against us. He has to curse us instead of bless us. That's what it means by provoking him. That is by the unrighteous use of our agency and partaking of iniquity. It then provokes God that he must then bring out a punishment if we do not repent. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this helped you with some of the doctrines and principles in the scripture block. If you enjoyed the presentation, please hit the like button.